Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School. <laughs> well, this is the first time I got an applause after saying nothing. <laughs> I'll make that a habit now. <laughs> so anyway, my co-author Jeffrey Sung and I are very happy to uh, welcome you to this uh, book launch event. Uh, I'm sorry to inform you that you will see me twice, uh, at least on the stage. Uh, I'm here now to make three procedural points before I come up later to make three substantive points because of the instruction of my guru, Tombiko, I never make more than three points. <laughs> so my three procedural points, the first one, of course, is to welcome uh, all of you. Jeffrey and I would like to welcome all of you because we know how busy you are, how many choices you have, so the fact that you took time of your busy schedule to come for this book launch, we really appreciate it. And of course, we are overwhelmed by the number of VIPs uh, who have come. So I'm, I have absolutely no doubt that we have bruised the egos of some VIPs tonight. If we did, please accept our apologies in advance, but we're very delighted that you could uh, come here. The second point I was going to make here is that I have a lot of people uh, to thank uh, tonight, but I'll go to them as quickly as I can. The first and the most important person I really need to thank is our guest of honor, Professor Wang Gangwu. By the way, for the record, now this is the fifth book of mine for which he's being the guest of honor. And he actually said to me before this, a round of applause. He said to me, enough is enough. I said, okay, last one. <laughs> But we're really, really happy that you'll be joining us for the discussion. I want to thank DBS Bank for sponsoring the launch and the reception. I hope you'll come to the reception uh, after this. Uh, I do want to thank especially the Lee Foundation and Dr. Lee Seng Ti for giving us a grant to have this book translated into every ASEAN language. And I think this may be the first book ever to be translated to each, every ASEAN language. So. Uh, I also want to thank my friend uh, Kui Leong Tech, who's agreed to buy books to distribute to all the schools and libraries in Singapore. So a round of applause for Leong Tech also. <laughs> and I, as I will explain later, uh, it is actually vital for Singaporeans to know more about ASEAN. So this, this is what we hope to do. I want to thank, of course, uh, as you know, no book gets done by authors alone, is the research assistants who do all the work. <laughs> so I want to thank Amrita, Kristen, Roda, and Vandana. So round of applause for the research assistants. <laughs> and I want to thank also the publishing team, Peter Shoppert, Paul Klotoska, and Sunandini, uh, also here, and I want to thank them. And of course, I want to thank the many people who gave very generous blurbs for this book. There are 10 of them, so I won't mention all 10 names. But Jeffrey and I are actually uh, deeply touched that at least three former leaders of ASEAN, uh, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Goh Chok Tong, the former President of Indonesia, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, and the former Prime Minister of Thailand, Anand Panyarakun, have endorsed this book on ASEAN. So it's really Again, uh, very reassuring that it's been accepted by some of the leaders of ASEAN. And of course, as you, if you read the book in the acknowledgements, uh, you will see that uh, we spoke to a lot of people. Some of them are here tonight, like Mr. Dana Balan, who played a critical role in the early years of ASEAN. So we thank them also uh, in the book. So my final procedural point is, uh, please try to stay for the book launch. But more importantly, please come for the book purchase <laughs> and signing. And we promise you there will be good food and good wine also. So thank you very much. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to call on my co-author, Jeffrey Sung, to speak first. He'll be followed by me and then by Professor Wang Gangwu. And then we'll come up for the Q&A session. And then we'll have the unveiling. And after the unveiling, you'll see Jeffrey and me make a 100-meter dash to the <laughs> Wee Tiong Am Hall to be ready there for the signing of the book. So have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Jeffrey. Good evening. 
Professor Wang Gangwu, Professor Kishore Mabubani, uh, distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a deep honor for me to be here this evening. I am especially gratified to co-author this book with my famous childhood friend, <laughs> Professor Kishore Mabubani. Uh, many authors used to tell me that writing a book can be a funny experience. They say, you know, you start to write a book, and when you finish, you find that you have written another book, not the book that you started out to write. Mm. A book can take on a life of its own. Mm. I used to joke with Kishore. I said, hey, Kishore, weren't we <laughs> supposed to write a book on the history of Southeast Asia with a chapter on ASEAN? We, we have written a book on ASEAN with a chapter on history. Well, the history part is about the four successive waves of Indian, Chinese, Muslim, and Western influence that descended on Southeast Asia. These influences left uh, a deep mark on our region. We decided to call uh, this history part the four waves. Though the history part has been shortened, uh, it helps to understand ASEAN. So let me uh, quickly say a few words about these uh, uh, four waves. Uh, to me, the wave concept is uh, an apt metaphor to describe the influx of uh, external demographic and cultural influence into Southeast Asia. The first big uh, cultural influence on Southeast Asia came from India. Before the beginning of the Christian era, India underwent an explosive cultural renaissance sort of a, a cultural Big Bang, so to speak. The energy of this Indian Renaissance projected Indic civilization outwards to Central Asia, China, and uh, Southeast Asia. The famous uh, Frenchman, archaeologist, George Sedis, has uh, written a book about the spread of Indian civilization to Southeast Asia, titled The Indianized States of Southeast Asia. Indic civilization has had uh, a deep influence on the language, writing, art, uh, court culture, and literature throughout mainland Southeast Asia. Today, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia are Buddhists. Vietnam is also Buddhist, though Vietnam absorbed Buddhism via China. The traditional arts of Southeast Asia, it's, cult, it's uh, poetry, sculpture, painting, drama, uh, uh, and uh, architecture, was deeply inspired by the great Indian epics, the Ramayana, Mahabharata, and Indian art forms. Today, uh, Brahmin ritual is still alive and well in the courts of Thailand and Cambodia. <clears throat> Above all, Indian influence is embodied in the spectacular architectural ruins of Angkor Wat. Indian influence also arrived in maritime Southeast Asia. <clears throat> the gigantic uh, monuments of uh, Borobudur and Prambanan echo what we have already mentioned uh, at, at Angkor. Moreover, uh, Southeast Asia's Ancient Southeast Asia's most uh, famous state, Srivijaya, was a Buddhist kingdom. Mm. Like the Ramayana, the uh, uh, Mahabharata has deeply influenced the popular Javanese uh, shadow play theatre, the Wayang Kulit. And I could give more examples, but suffice to say that Indian influence has had uh, uh, a lasting imprint and can be seen all around us in Southeast Asia. The next big influence to come into Southeast Asia is, of course, Chinese uh, influence. <clears throat> uh, Southeast Asia is pressed between two giants, China on the one hand and India on the other. Mm. Chinese have uh, migrated to Southeast Asia for thousands of years 
whenever there is a, a cataclysmic event in, in, in China, it tends to translate into uh, population movements into Southeast Asia. War, famine, dynastic change, uh, breakdown of uh, social order, uh, <coughs> has often caused population exodus from China to uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, <coughs> over time, a huge overseas Chinese uh, diaspora has uh, taken shape uh, in Southeast Asia, embodied by Chinatown stretching from Penang to Malacca to Singapore and, uh, and Manila. The proximity of China to Southeast Asia also means that the two regions are always closely linked by travel and trade. Trade has also spawned a proliferation of Chinese merchant communities at the port cities throughout the South China Sea. Trade is very important to Southeast Asia. For ancient uh, polities like Ayutthaya, Malacca, uh, Maluku, Hoi An, and Manila, the China trade had become their economic lifeline. So important was trade to these kingdoms that many were willing to submit to become vassals of China under the tributary system in order to gain access to the huge China market, a situation that is uh, reminiscent of today. When Islam spread from the Middle East to Central Asia and eventually conquered India, the great historic Silk Road and its uh, coastal tributaries came under the control of Muslim merchants and middlemen. The ascendancy of Muslim merchants and middlemen uh, and trade networks in world trade had far-reaching ramifications. Islam began to spread along the maritime Silk Road to Southeast Asia. Formerly Hindu Buddhist kingdoms like Aceh, Patani and uh, Malacca began to court Muslim merchants to promote trade. Sometimes the ruler like the founder of, Paramis, uh, of Malacca, Parameswara, considered it prudent to convert to Islam. When the ruler has converted, it often becomes mandatory for his whole subject uh, people to also become Muslim. However, uh, <clears throat> be that as it may, the spread of Islam throughout Southeast Asia has been a peaceful and slow process taking several centuries. Ironically, it was the arrival of the West that spurred the rapid Islamization of Southeast Asia during the 16th and 17th centuries. <clears throat> Unlike the Indians, Chinese and Muslims who came, the arrival of the West was heralded by violence. The Portuguese announced their presence in the Indian Ocean by attacking and sinking Muslim shipping. Brian Harrison, in his book, A History of Southeast Asia, described how the fleet of Vasco da Gama attacked and sunk a Muslim merchantman full of men, women, and children. When the Portuguese came to Southeast Asia, they attacked and conquered Malacca. <clears throat> Local mercantile interests felt threatened by the arrival of the West. Local uh, mercantile interests felt threatened by the arrival of the West and resistance translated naturally into sympathy for the enemy of the West, Islam. Moreover, Islam has repeatedly demonstrated its military prowess and superiority over Western armies on land. News of the dramatic and legendary conquest of Christian Constantinople by the Muslim Ottoman Turks spread to Southeast Asia and encouraged local rulers to embrace Islam as a form of resistance to Western expansion into the region. However, in the long run, in the end, European technology and sea power prevailed in establishing Western hegemony over Southeast Asia. By the late 19th century, the West had colonized and divided up the region among the British, the French, and Holland. 
Spain held on to the Philippines, whilst the Portuguese failed to retain their colonies except Timor. And the rest is modern history, where Professor Kishore is going to take you in a moment. Without further ado, as time's up, may I hand over the floor to Professor Kishore for his main ASEAN presentation this evening. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you very much, Jeffrey. You've set the stage brilliantly uh, for my presentation, and uh, I have 15 minutes uh, to make three points <laughs> on the substance of the book. And the, the three points I'm going to speak about are, number one, why do we call ASEAN a miracle? What challenges does ASEAN face now? And thirdly, what are the potential solutions for some of the challenges that ASEAN faces? But let me begin by emphasizing that the description miracle is not an exaggeration at all. And why is it not an exaggeration? Because when ASEAN was born on 8th August, 1967, it was destined to fail. In fact, its two predecessors, Asa and Mafilindo, died within two years. And I, I bet you that when the five signatories went to Bangkok to sign the ASEAN Declaration, then none of them would have dreamt that we would be here 50 years later to celebrate ASEAN as the second most successful regional organization in the world. So why, why do I emphasize that it should have failed? Because as Jeffrey pointed out, if you want to choose a region, any region, anywhere in the world, to start a process of regional organization, the last place you go to is Southeast Asia. Because no other region on planet Earth is as diverse as Southeast Asia is. Among 601 million people, 250 million Muslims, 120 million Christians, 180 million Buddhists of different kinds, and Taoists, Confucianists, and so on and so forth. So this is not the, the ideal region. And in the 60s and 70s, this region was like the Middle East. There were bombs falling everywhere. This is one of the most conflict-ridden regions in the world. And to make matters worse, the five founding uh, members, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, all had bilateral problems with each other. So you can give reason after reason why it should have failed. So if you want to know why it succeeded, you have to read the book. I'll give you a clue. I have a series of four-letter words. The first one begins with an F, so it's easy to remember. But have a look at it. But I want to fast forward to explaining why it is a, a miracle. Because number one, as it has taken one of the most difficult regions on planet Earth and made it one of the most peaceful corners. Just the sheer peace that it has developed is a really big deal. Because if you look around the world today, you see so much pessimism about the world, right? People look at Syria, they look at Iraq, they look at Libya, they look at Yemen. And Southeast Asia could have been like that. Seriously. But what saved it was ASEAN. And it's actually quite shocking that so many Singaporeans take this peace for granted. Because it need not have happened. Maybe it should not have happened. So it's a miracle that it has happened. And I emphasize that Singaporeans are by far the biggest beneficiaries of ASEAN peace because no other country in ASEAN, indeed no other country in the whole world, 
has total trade, which is four times the size of its GNP. If my figures are right, it's about $1.2 trillion. This $1.2 trillion would shrivel up and disappear if you had conflict in this region. So we have a lot to thank ASEAN for. And of course, ASEAN has delivered incredible amount of prosperity. Just to indicate how, how big the gains have been, in 1970, the combined GNP of ASEAN was 95 billion. By 2010, it had hit close to uh, 2 trillion, 20 times, and now, as you know, it's about 2.5 trillion. And our total trade has gone up 91 times since 1970. That's amazing. That's ASEAN's gift. The, the, our trade with China has gone up from 8 billion to 160 billion, 20 times. Same, 18 times increase our trade with India. How did all this happen? Because of ASEAN. But there's one third dimension that ASEAN has contributed that has been sadly under-recognized in the world, and in fact, under-recognized in Southeast Asia. And this is that ASEAN's genius for delivering peace has not just been shared in Southeast Asia alone, it's been shared with the larger East Asian region also. And we all know that one of the modern miracles of our time is the peaceful emergence of China. Now, it happened, of course, because of the skill and wisdom of the Chinese leaders. But the fact that ASEAN created an ecosystem of peace, bringing the, all the great power leaders to meet every year under the ASEAN umbrella, ensured that this geopolitical benefit spread to the larger region. So I hope that the countries of the region will also one day send an appropriate thank you note to ASEAN for having delivered this peace. So that's the miracle part. But as we all know, life never progresses up in a straight line, and ASEAN is facing some challenges. And one reason why I actually was very keen to work with Jeffrey to produce this book this year is one, of course, to celebrate the 50th anniversary in August. But at the same time, I do think that ASEAN is beginning to face some really serious challenges of a magnitude it may not have faced before. And what are these challenges? I'll emphasize three of them, but clearly the first one is the most important. And what's the first one? Which is that we are going to experience in this region probably the greatest geopolitical transition ever seen in human history. Where the number one power in the world, which today is the United States, world is now being challenged by an emerging power, the number two power, which is China. And history has taught us, okay, 2,000 years of history, that whenever the number two power is about to overtake the number one power, there's always maximum geopolitical tension. So far, touch wood, huh? we are witnessing a situation of amazing calm. This calm is abnormal. The abnormal goes back to the normal. And then you will see rising tension. And there is no doubt that if there is greater geopolitical competition between US and China, the regional organization that will be affected most by it will be ASEAN. So you'll find in the book a very fervent plea which is addressed to both Beijing and Washington DC that, okay, you have to compete. It's natural. But please don't break this delicate Ming vase called ASEAN, because if you do so, we will all suffer. So that's also another reason why this book is so urgent and so pressing. And I hope that you will mail copies of it 
to Beijing and Washington. <laughs> and of course, there are other challenges. There is, this is a long story of ASEAN. There's always a gap within the promise of ASEAN and the performance. And that gap we could live with for a long time when the situation was calm. But now when the challenges are coming in, ASEAN must catch up, must deliver more in terms of its performance. And it's actually, I was reading the Straits Times just today, that even as we meet here to discuss ASEAN, the ASEAN economic ministers are having a retreat today to discuss how to improve the economic performance of ASEAN. And the third challenge that ASEAN faces, of course, is that it's a project that is successful, but it is owned primarily by the governments of ASEAN and not by the people of ASEAN. Actually, it's quite shocking to see the level of ignorance, including in Singapore, about ASEAN. So for ASEAN to survive over the long term, this is a project which has to be owned not just by the governments, it has to be owned by the people too. And this is what we hope to achieve uh, with our book. So what, let me quickly conclude by suggest talking about three solutions that we put across uh, in the book for strengthening ASEAN. And some of them are amazingly easy. The first one, you know, again, I don't have, if you look at the statistics, huh? EU is the most successful regional organization ASEAN is the second most successful regional organization. And by the way, in some ways, uh, if Brexit happens and the EU breaks up, technically ASEAN is more successful because we haven't broken up while the EU was broken up, right? But you look at the budget of the EU, again, I don't have the data here. It's about a few thousand times the size of the ASEAN Secretariat budget. And why is the ASEAN Secretariat budget so small? Because amazingly, all international organizations, all major international organizations have a budget that is, uh, in which they tax the members on the basis of capacity to pay. Rich countries pay more, poor countries pay less. ASEAN is the only regional organization where all members, rich and poor, pay the same. So it means that basically the budget is constrained by the capacity to pay of the poorest country. And that restricts ASEAN's growth. So why doesn't ASEAN just switch and use a principle that all international organizations use, base it on the principle of capacity to pay, you pay your share of the total GNP, and the ASEAN Secretariat can grow. And if it happens, Singapore will be the biggest beneficiary. So that's one easy solution. The second thing we, second solution we put across, which is hopefully will be, which others have made, we're just copying from others, that to create a sense of ASEAN spirit, ASEAN ownership, why not have ASEAN jointly host either the World Cup or the Olympics? It's not an original idea of ours. Others have proposed it before. We can do it too. And that will make the people of ASEAN own ASEAN if they see an ASEAN World Cup or ASEAN Olympics. And our third and final idea, which is also long overdue, which is that if you're looking around for organizations in the world that have delivered peace, no one has done more than ASEAN. And so isn't it logical that this year we should all combine together and nominate ASEAN for the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you very much. Dangu, my friend. Jeffrey and Kishore, thank you very much for asking me uh, to speak today. Uh, Kishore has explained that uh, I will not have to do it again. But actually, it has been a real test of my capacity to learn because each time I've had to do it, I had to read the book. And uh, Kishore had made a very strong point uh, in the past, never to give a book to anybody unless he promises to read it. So if I wanted the copy, I had to read it anyway. So in that case, uh, 
I might as well say something about it. In this case, I've had the privilege of reading the book. You haven't yet. But I can say I share Kishore's enthusiasm that you should buy it and read it because uh, he does actually pro project a picture of ASEAN that is the most comprehensive I've ever seen and also gives ASEAN the kind of credit that it hasn't received for a long, long time. Uh, he uses the word miracle. I, being a non-religious person, don't like words like miracle. But I think in the uh, secular world we live in, where miracles are indeed rare, I share Kishore's feeling that this is pretty near one of those. And uh, appreciation of this achievement is yet to come. And it may well be that uh, in time, when ASEAN has been tested again and again, and maybe, as uh, Kishore says, some of the challenges are beyond ASEAN's control, and ASEAN may not succeed in overcoming all the challenges it still has to face. So it may well be that uh, this miracle can't go to its final conclusion and succeed to, in the eyes of the whole world. But that is for the future. You read the book and I think you'll find that there's much there that has not been told fully. And I can tell you this, that uh, Kishore has lived through it in a way which, while some of us have seen ASEAN grow the last 50 years, Kishore has actually been through it, the different stages of it. He's mentioned some of them. When he began, hardly anybody expected it to succeed. Halfway through, when the Vietnam War ended, lots of people thought there was no need for ASEAN because ASEAN was partly formed in the context of the Cold War when there was uh, as it were, a fear of communism that united some of the states and brought the leaders together. And yet, it was in the context of actually that end of the Vietnam War that the task of ASEAN was shown to be something quite unique. And that was when the conflict between Vietnam and Cambodia started. And I think this is what really has inspired Kishore because that was where he was. Uh, he mentions in his book several times about luck in Southeast Asia. We are lucky that Kishore was in Cambodia when that happened. And I think this has spurred him and stirred his imagination. He's never been able to shake it off to see ASEAN as something totally remarkable. Because it was in that extraordinary conflict, which lasted a long time, and a very, very bitter one, almost as bad, if not possibly worse than the Vietnam War itself, that showed that ASEAN had a role to play, precisely in an area which nobody expected it to play, for a small group of countries to actually play a role in peacemaking. And that's what it did that out of that Cambodia conflict and ASEAN's very deliberate efforts to join in and participate in that very complex affair ended up by, by actually sharing the success story of bringing peace to two very ancient enemies. And that has still stayed with us. And in fact, what re really was remarkable that followed, that after that, Vietnam jo joined ASEAN and then, one after the other, the remaining three states on the mainland also joined ASEAN. And for, the, again, uh, this is probably as close to a miracle that, as that one can imagine, is that suddenly all these states became part of an ASEAN that had ten members instead of five or six. A remarkable change, unexpected, and I can assure you that looking at the records, I don't think any of those six, five leaders that you mentioned in 1967 could have imagined that ASEAN would actually one day be all of Southeast Asia. I think at that point it was just a matter of survival. And Kishore reminds us of one of the underlying themes of ASEAN itself at the time was fear. Fear of fighting among ourselves, the five countries involved, fear of communism because the Vietnamese were doing well 
and the Americans were struggling to keep the Vietnamese nationalists at bay. And the force of communism all over the world at that point had reached a sort of peak in which even the rest of the world had been alarmed. But for Southeast Asia, there was a strong element of fear, something that we don't, a word that we don't often use, but indeed it was fear. And what I think is so interesting is that that fear was translated over time by small gains at achieving peace among the members of ASEAN, and that major gain in participating in the peace in the Indochina states between Vietnam and Cambodia gave ASEAN a sense of mission, a very much clearer sense of mission, which it had not, I believe, had not started out with. And that turning point itself was truly remarkable. I can go on, but I can tell you it's all in the book, so let me not, <laughs> let me not uh, waste your time. Uh, read it, because it really tells you the story. And not only that, Kishaw doesn't simply tell you the outline of the story. Uh, he actually, through anecdotes of his own personal experience, and all the people he spoke to, all the people he knew who had participated in the shape and shaping and forming of uh, ASEAN, to tell their story and add many dimensions to a very complex story. It's all in the book, so I won't, I won't go any further. But I want to add one other element, and this takes us back to Jeffrey's point about the history of the, all the different peoples in ASEAN and why it was so improbable that this very mixed group of people should actually be able to come up with something so remarkable as this regional organization. And I want to go back to the concept of Southeast Asia itself, just to add, add another dimension to this extraordinary achievement of ASEAN. The region did not have a common name at all, as far as I can tell. All through those thousands of years, when all those waves of influences that Jeffrey spoke about, there never was a name for the place. So nobody conceived of it of, of any kind of region whatsoever. In fact, the first that I could uh, find anything of, in, incidentally, all these phrases like Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese or Islamic uh, waves and so on, none of all that was crystallized in any kind of uh, uh, description of the region or, or any kind of commonality of the region. But there was something there, obviously. And what was it? Where did this name Southeast Asia come from? As far as I can tell, it's a very modern name indeed. It really came to our attention after the Second World War. Before that, I had come across phrase attempts to try and give a name to the place, really by Western geographers, explorers in the 19th century. Uh, and I, the first that I caught my eye was Malaisie. This is by the French explorers. And it described the island world of the Malay world, You're trying to find one word for it. Um, another word which the French also found in the days when they were trying to work out commonalities in the region was Indochine, Indochina, what we better now know as Indochina. And that, of course, tries to capture the fact that this was all those miscellaneous bits in between India and China. Because they had no name for it, Indochina seemed to have been the, the way out. So you can see how, how difficult it was for even people to conceive of such a region. And yet, when, it, when the name came, the Southeast Asian name was devised out of the military needs of uh, the Second World War. When we first hear of it, seriously and sustainedly used was the Southeast Asia Command. The British used that. Now Lord Mountbatten in Colombo was head of the Southeast Asia Command. And after the war, by, the, by the end of the war, one after the other, articles, books, mushroomed. And we had the first history of Southeast Asia, the first geography of Southeast Asia, one after the other, essentially coming from the British. At that point, it was the British who saw it. Why did they say it that way? And we look back on it. They used their own experiences of the West to try and find a way of classifying or identifying this region. 
And the concept that caught their minds, their imagination, was the way we were the Balkans. They were afraid that when the British Empire and all the French and Dutch empires, even the Americans, moved out of the region, this whole place would be Balkanized, using the nightmarish term of the central, south central, uh, southeastern central Europe uh, that described that very complicated area which was in, somewhere in between the Ottoman and the Austro-Hungarian empires. And that, of course, had been a European problem for a long, long time. And the fact that that image was, read, what, was what led the British strategists to use for this region was itself quite interesting. That was how they saw it. This fragmented area, and once the, the European powers leave, then either China or India will come to dominate it in a way which is not in the interest of the British Empire at that time, as the British saw it. And the same idea was got picked up by the Americans in the context of the Cold War. And in the Cold War, again, uh, this became an area of conflict, of challenge. Both sides wanted very much to win over all the new nation states that had, been, that had come out of decolonization at the end of the empire, the age of empires. And each side wanted to win as many supporters as possible through ideological uh, propaganda for communism. And in that context, this region was immediately divided between those that were leaning towards the communists and those that were depending on the capitalists. And that division made everybody conscious that this was a fragmented area and the, the word Balkans was actually applicable. And it was in that context, again, that you find the idea of forming an organization appearing in the literature. Uh, Kisho, I just mentioned Sito. Oh no, you mentioned Asa and uh, Mafilindo, and so, but he didn't mention Sito, but Sito actually was behind it all. It was supposed to be modeled on the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. If NATO su can succeed in Europe, then probably that was a way for this part of the world to be united in a combined effort to push out communism from this area. And CETA was formed. And just remember what CETA was. I think some of you may well remember that. But it actually consisted of places outside of Southeast Asia as well. There's no real idea of a region. I remember when I first came across the term, I was astonished to find that Pakistan was a member of CETA. So that's how our sense of geography, what Southeast Asia meant. It was a Southeast Asia treaty organization, including Pakistan. So that's, that's what it was like then. So you can see that this idea of a region of Southeast Asia was far from easy to, for anybody to grasp, even at that time. And the Cold War didn't help, because that was an ideological division. It had nothing to do with history, geography, or even the economic interests of the country. It was strictly along political divisions. But this is the background. I say this because we are now faced with something that really has never happened. Will it be allowed to happen and really succeed in the long run is still a bit of a question mark. But nevertheless, Southeast Asia has become now widely accepted, much more so than ASEAN, you might say. People talk about Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia does has begun, I think, to, make, to be meaningful in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of a lot of people. But ASEAN has not yet gained that status. But between them, it seems to me that we have to work hard to ensure that the idea of Southeast Asia and its origins as a region in the minds of geographers, historians, strategists, and political planners for the future, that that is the same thing as what ASEAN should be. In fact, that's the heart of ASEAN and why it can succeed. And this brings me back to my final point. ASEAN, as mentioned, is located where it is between two oceans, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And we know that it was through those two oceans that the West brought all the modern science and technology and the economic miracles of the Industrial Revolution to this part of the world. The fact that it's located there has always been true. When you look at all the peoples of ASEAN, 
apart from the cultural influences, the indigenous peoples of ASEAN who came thousands of years ago, where did they come from? It's good to remind ourselves that part of them came by sea from the mainland of Asia and spread out right across the oceans in many, many directions. In fact, that is how the word Malaysia, Malaysia came from. It was because the French explorers at that time recognized that these people who, who, who settled all the, the island world between the two oceans were the same people with roughly the same culture, same linguistic structures, same family of languages, and they spread out from, and the French found the words for it, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Malaysia. Malaysia. These are the four names that they use. And it was to link up with those two oceans. That was how actually it was first conceived by the geographers in the, in the beginnings of a globalized uh, maritime world. The second part, the Endoshin part, again recognizes the fact that the land part of this region was between India and China. And that remains true and will never change. That would be fundamental to, the, to, the, to our region. And yet that fact must be, as it were, captured by the fact that the people of those areas that Jeffrey described in the mainland states came not by sea, but down the river valleys from Tibet and Yunnan, in fact also from parts of southern China. And they came over the last 2,000 years or so, particularly about, they started about 2,000 odd years ago, and ultimately took over all the state systems of the north. The original Mon Khmers had kingdoms, but the Mon Khmer kingdoms are now dominated by others. Only the Khmers have survived in Cambodia, but the uh, Vietnamese, uh, uh, part of that Mon Khmer people, have dominated one part. The Thais and the Burmese and various groups of Burmese have come from the north, have created other kingdoms. So that connection with those river valleys from the north remains very powerful. And that is one of the challenges. So the extraordinary part of the ASEAN story, it is being built upon this very deeply rooted cultural commonality, but over time fractured by geography and history and now facing very great changes and challenges that he had mentioned in, the, in his chapter on the great powers. And indeed, it's an it's a alarming set of stories that he tells, but not one that, uh, that uh, one need to despair of, uh, because in the end, much depends on how these groups of people within this region called Southeast Asia can sustain this idea of ASEAN. And I believe one of the major thing, reasons why it may have a very good chance to succeed is to make full use of its location between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. When you recognize that, and that historically, that is how it was understood from the, from the beginning, between those two oceans, then you can actually recognize the fundamental centrality of, of the Southeast Asian region that people claim for the region. That centrality is not, to be, is not assured. It cannot be guaranteed. It has to be slowly built up and has to be won and deserved, and it will not be easy. But the fact is that all the neighbors in the area today, and this comes out in the book very clearly, if any, every one of those regional areas from United States, China, India, Japan, Australia, and even, even beyond in the, in, the, in the Middle East, they recognize that this is an area they want to have peaceful and successful so that they can avoid having trouble with each other. That actually offers ASEAN the centrality that will make it ultimately successful. And it is with that hope in mind that I hope that uh, Kishore's suggestion that it give, be given a Nobel Peace Prize comes, comes, across, comes through. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, as you know, the time flies. We have about 20 <coughs> minutes. So uh, the floor, floor is open for questions. But let me just quickly, if you don't mind, some of you may be puzzled as to why I've written this book with Jeffrey. A small biographical note. I grew up in a poor neighborhood, in a poor Indian family in Juchat Road, near Juchat Road. He grew up in a poor neighborhood, uh, in a poor Chinese family. <laughs> We've known each other since the age of six. 
Now, over the last 60 years, our paths have diverged in many ways. But what we discovered was that we have developed a common love for the Southeast Asia that you spoke about so eloquently. And I must say that that's, that's something which we hope our book conveys in some way, a passion for this region and why this region is really, really special and why its specialness, unfortunately, has not been appreciated enough by the world or by Singapore. And that's what I hope, that's what I hope the book also. I, I might add here to say that I saw the book as a Singapore story, the story <laughs> of these two men, but also the product of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have some questions. Uh, the ambassador from Ka Kazakhstan, please, can you go to the microphone if you don't mind? Yeah, and then Anthony, after that, if you don't mind, then game in, yeah, yeah. So since we don't have much time, shall we? Uh... Uh, my question to all three professors to which I'm fascinated. Uh, which option is benefit, more beneficial for ASEAN? Trans-Pacific Partnership or Comprehensive Economic Development Partnership? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one question. TPP or RCEP? <laughs> okay, Anthony? Yeah. Yes, I, I think we must remember also the giants that helped create it, like our Raja Ratnam, Tuntanak Komen, and one Carlos Ramulas, who may not be very tall, but a giant of a man. But my question really is, the wave, the big waves, and by 1450, Islam came here. And in history, Ibn Battuta came by this area in the 1370s. But this week, King Salman came. And King Salman came to almost all ASEAN countries. But one of the issues I have is what is happening to us in ASEAN, in particular countries, where the politics is beginning to be more religious, like in Ahok's election in Jakarta, like in the trends that we are seeing in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. G uh, Gamin? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I think there's one thing that all Southeast Asians can feel very proud of without having a World Cup or Nobel Prize uh, brought here, and that's our biodiversity, which I have not heard any of the authors mention. We have the richest biological diversity, both in the marine and the um, uh, terrestrial region, and, and that is why we are recognized by biologists and scientists, and that's why a lot of people came here, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace being one. I bring this up because I think ASEAN has failed to preserve our biodiversity or our environment. It's been very successful economically, socially, politically, but it has one, you know, it's not really, the environment isn't even one of the three pillars. So um, this is going to be a major challenge in future. I only mentioned the haze. Uh, water scarcity in some countries and depleted fisheries. But if ASEAN does not fix more on the environment, I think we're not going to be able to solve our other problems, economic, political, or otherwise. Thank you. Three good questions. I tell you, what, let me, the, if the history questions are passed to you, Jeffrey, since are the contemporary questions, I'll try to address them. And if you want to add anything, no, no. maybe you want to add something on biodiversity later. Mm, maybe I'll do, do the Islam thing about the secular thing. Okay, sure. Okay, I, the, <laughs> on the TPP and uh, uh, RCEP, the, I think the attitude of the region is the more trade agreements, the merrier. And uh, one thing that Ambassador Tomiko, my guru, always says is that Singapore is the most promiscuous country in the world when it comes to signing free trade agreements. <laughs> and I think Singapore will continue the tradition. But the good news is that it's not just a Singapore thing. Uh, at a time when Donald Trump is moving away from NAFTA and TPP, this region is actually moving forward in terms of trade agreements and there's been no backsliding uh, in this region. So I think if, for example, if TPP is revived again, I think the countries in this region will be very happy. So it's not a choice, it's not either or, you can have both. And, and, and that's, that's what I think this uh, 
Eden will do. But Gamian, let me uh, quickly touch on biodiversity. I completely agree with you. That's, that's one of the miracles of Southeast Asia. And that's something that we don't speak about enough uh, on the biodiversity. On, on, the, on the Islam question, I'll, uh, before I pass it to, to Jeffrey, I want to um, emphasize that, of course, there are lots of challenges there. But it is still remarkable that the capital of Indonesia, the governor, is a, is a Chinese Christian. That's actually quite remarkable. Now, of course, there are challenges. It's inevitable that there are challenges. But the fact that it's happened shows the openness of uh, the society of Indonesia. Oh, yeah. Oh, to <clears throat> a follow up on that question about the rise of uh, religious influence in this region and the decline of secularism, I would like to just share uh, my memory of a conversation I had with the late Indonesian president Abdul Rahman Wahid. I used to know him very well. I used to live in his house. And uh, his family is very central to the Nada to Ulama. And his uncle was Kiai Yusuf, you know, from who lived in Tabu Irang at that time. And the fundamentalist Muslims, uh, including the Nada to Ulama, played a big role you know, during the uh, events following the fall of Sukarno regime and the rise of Suharto. But what Abdul Rahman Wahid said to me, you know, was shocking to me at that time. He said, I asked him about Islamic fundamentalism. And he said, you know, Jeffrey, Islamic fundamental, fundamentalism originated in Indonesia. I said, yeah, what? What is it about? Is it true? You know? Well, he said, well, yes, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Uh, around that time, uh, the West began experimenting with the idea of using religion yeah, to topple, to effect regime change of secular governments that were unfriendly. And the test case, according to Guzdur, was in Indonesia. And uh, as you know, from the end result was that uh, <clears throat> you have the rise of Suharto and the, you know, uh, the formation of uh, ASEAN. Uh, in the wake of all that, it was successful. And uh, based on that success, you know, it then uh, encouraged uh, the U.S. to spread it to the, to, uh, through the Asian mainland. And the, the second the major development was in Afghanistan. And then after that, uh, the uh, follow-up, the spillover, if you like, of Afghanistan went to the Middle East, and you have Al Qaeda and ISIS today. Anyway, just to share some insights from a conversation with uh, an Indonesian leader previously. Next question, please. Yes, can you go through a microphone, please? Yeah. <coughs> we have about 10 minutes. Yeah. Good evening. I'm with the Swiss Embassy in Singapore. My question is about next year's chairmanship of ASEAN that Singapore is having. I was wondering where you would see um, action points for Singapore or where should Singapore put emphasis during its chairmanship? Thank you. Huh. Okay, any, any other questions? Yes, please, yeah. Oh dear, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I have a question that we Tan, know... Professor Tan Kik, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm also from uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. You know, I remember uh, late uh, Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew told us that ASEAN should not choose side. But we also know that some ASEAN members have chosen side. But some have chosen but pretend not that they have not. <laughs> so, <laughs> my question is, and, and he says some big power told ASEAN members that it's impossible that you don't choose side. You have to choose side someday at some time. So is it possible that, that ASEAN members can afford not to choose side even we are being forced? And if you are being forced, then how should you choose? Thank you. Hey, one, maybe take one more question before we do the unveiling. I see a hand at the back. Yes, please come to the microphone. Yes. And introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chexia from ST. Uh, you mentioned in your book something about ASEAN moving similar to a crab, two steps forward, one step back, and one step to the side. With 
ASEAN preparing to um, agree on a framework for a code of conduct later this year and hoping for a legally binding code of conduct maybe in the future. What, are, what is your expectation about the process? Do you think the deadlines will be met? Do you think we will be able to see something like a legally binding code of conduct within the next few years, within the decade? Okay, three questions on ASEAN. So, so I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <You want some? laughs> the, the first one from the Swiss Embassy on what Singapore's agenda is for its ASEAN chairmanship. Uh, I'm very sorry to inform you that I have zero connections with the Foreign Ministry of Singapore now. <laughs> I actually, I was, I, it's a true story. I was actually offered to the post of ambassador at large, but I said, please, if I accept the post of ambassador at large, I cannot write books. So I decided to leave the foreign ministry completely. But at the same time, I have, knowing the foreign ministry, having worked there for 33 years, I have no doubt that Singapore will have a very active agenda because that's the nature uh, of Singapore. So they will try to push for some things that will be concrete and realizable. But what they will be, frankly, I, I not, I'm not part of the internal deliberations. But I can assure you that at the end of the Singapore chairmanship, there will be concrete positive results. So that, that confidence I have in the foreign ministry. Now, Kigiap's question is, of course, a much harder one about uh, will ASEAN take sides, has it taken sides, and so on and so forth. The fact of the matter is that there are some eternal facts of geopolitics that can never be erased. <laughs> that when great power competition steps up, small countries are in a very uncomfortable position. That's been true for thousands of years. So that's why the, one of the key messages of the book is that the ASEAN countries will be in an uncomfortable position. That's, you can't avoid it. And we, we got a, one sign of it already in the 2012 uh, ASEAN um, foreign ministers meeting, the first meeting ever not to agree to a joint communique. In the book, we say that we are glad that that happened because that was a wake-up call for ASEAN. Get ready. So I would say that uh, the ASEAN countries must therefore expect geopolitical competition and then work hard to preserve ASEAN in the face of this growing geopolitical competition which means that they have to give a certain value to saying that, hey, we have a common interest in keeping it together and if necessary, work together to deflect uh, some of the pressures. So that, that's actually a very key part of the book and as uh, uh, Gangwu mentioned, there's a whole chapter on ASEAN and the great powers describing how ASEAN's relations with each of the great powers has got various uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, finally, to the question from the Straits Times, um, uh, let me say I'm very, very glad that you mentioned the analogy of a crab because one reason why people are very confused about ASEAN is that it always takes, you know, two steps forward, one step backward, one step sideways, and I say, we say in the book that it moves like a crab, you know. But the amazing thing is that if you look at this crab, you watch it in slow motion, it seems to be going around in circles. Then you watch it a decade later, boom, it's gone there. <laughs> a decade later, it's gone there. It's amazing how decade by decade, uh, ASEAN moves forward. So it's always a mistake to watch ASEAN in slow motion and watch the step backward, step forward, and so on and so forth. At the, at the end of the day, ASEAN keeps going. Now on the code of conduct, I cannot give you a, a, a definitive uh, answer. Will it be legally binding? I also don't know. But the more important thing is this. If the spirit of the code of conduct is accepted by all the claimants of the, in the South China Sea, Singapore, as you know, is not a claimant state. But if the certain spirit is accepted and everyone acts with a certain degree of restraint on South China Sea, as a result of that code of conduct, then it would have achieved its goal. So it's not the legally binding nature of these documents that matter. In fact, the way ASEAN works is, as we say in the book, the exact opposite of the way the European Union works. Everything in the European Union, you negotiate, you get very long treaties, long agreements. ASEAN documents are very thin. So it's the exact opposite. 
But it's not the document itself that matters, it's the spirit behind the documents. So for that reason, and if you notice by the way, as you all know, I'm not giving a big secret away, the temperature on the South China Sea, as you all know, has gone down significantly compared to where it was a year or two ago. So, so clearly something is happening behind the scenes to try and rein in the uh, situation. So at the end of the day, don't try to read ASEAN through legal documents. Look at the spirit of cooperation that ASEAN creates. That's the miracle uh, of ASEAN. So on that note, uh, I'm sorry to inform you that uh, we have to conclude the discussions, but we don't leave yet because Professor Wang, Jeffrey and I have to do some uh, unveiling. And then after that, as I mentioned, uh, Je Jeffrey and I are going to do a 100 meter dash to the uh, Wei Tionghaam building, but please join us there for the reception and the book signing. But uh, finally, let me thank you all very much for coming to this event. So with that, Gangwu, shall we please? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a free copy for Professor Wang. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jeff. Come, come, Jeffrey, come. Yeah. Okay, thank you.